is time for Hell in a Cell. Worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. A missing link in pink. I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway. Sometimes I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed. Feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lucene. We are back from a little bit of a hiatus, and we are coming at you with the top 10 Hell in a Cell matches. Starting with number 10, Batista versus Triple H at Vengeance 2005. This was one hell of a... Hell in a Cell match, no pun intended. Uh, but no, this was essentially the culmination of uh, Batista and Triple H's original feud, uh, going back to a little bit even before uh, the when um, sorry before WrestleMania when Batista won the Royal Rumble, and you had the lead up of would he choose to face JBL on SmackDown or would he choose to face Triple H on Raw? They even had the whole angle with the fake limousine attack, which I forgot about. Uh, but ultimately, Batista, uh, you know, having eavesdropped on a conversation between Triple H and Ric Flair, uh, would make the infamous decision, the thumbs down, uh, and then uh, facing Triple H at WrestleMania to take the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, but then also they had the match at Backlash, uh, which uh, Triple H tried every trick in the book to cheat uh, and win back the title, but he could not beat Batista. However, in true Triple H uh, Golden Shovel fashion at the time, could not let the feud go. Uh, but it was a great feud, to be honest. And um, Triple H essentially said, the only way I'll accept uh, that you're better than me is if you beat me in the Hell in a Cell, which at the time, Triple H had never lost a Hell in a Cell match except for the Armageddon six-man one, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but uh, that match, obviously, he didn't take the pinfall. Uh, so basically going in 4-0, and and this was a brutal, brutal match. Uh, they introduced a lot of different factors. You know, they had the sledgehammer, they had the chain. Uh, they even had a chair with barbed wire. It didn't make a ton of sense, but it was cool. Uh, and uh, ultimately, though, this uh, was just a brutal uh, drag-out Hell in a Cell match. Uh, Batista would go over in the end, kind of cementing, I think, his legacy Um as, uh, you know, a main eventer and a true uh, WWE champion. Uh, so I think this was really good. Uh, the whole feud, obviously, was great for Batista's career. But I think this trip, uh, the fact that he beat Triple H three times, including this Hell in a Cell match as the blow-off, um, you know, I think you, you could have seen Batista maybe get relegated if he had lost this match in particular. But no. Uh, Triple H obviously loves Dave, put him over here, and the rest is, as they say, history. Number nine, The Undertaker versus Edge. So while I was uh, doing uh, the research for this uh, top ten here, one of the things I found which was obvious was that The Undertaker has been in the most Hell in a Cell matches he's been in. 14 Hell in a Cell matches, which is crazy. Triple H is the second most at nine. So uh, Taker, very much the man, the most synonymous with the Hell in a Cell. Uh, he is eight and 14. But you know what I, I realized? I think the other person, and we'll talk about obviously later, one of the other names, the most synonymous with the Hell in a Cell, Mick Foley, the Buffalo Bills of Hell in a Cell. He's actually never won. Isn't that crazy? Um, but the only uh, reason I bring that up is to, uh, again, refer back to the history of The Undertaker uh, and this feud with Undertaker and Edge, again, also going back to their WrestleMania match, uh, which was a banger, and they ran it back in Hell in a Cell. 
And it was also a banger, especially there was that one great spot uh, where Edge goes like off the ladder through the ring. Uh, so again, one of the best Hell in a Cell matches, I think, of the modern era. Uh, I think, uh, again, also very much was... What I loved about Hell in a Cell matches like this was when they elevated a certain character, like even though Edge was already a main eventer, again, going into a Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker, he makes you famous is the is the old uh, phrasing in the line. Um, but I really think Edge held his own, uh, even though he ended up uh, losing um, this Hell in a Cell match to The Undertaker. Obviously, like, uh, it was just a crazy, crazy match. Uh, I know for a lot of people, this could be even a little bit higher on the list. Uh, but, I mean, this this was actually a pretty hard list to put together. But I kind of went with a little bit of favoritism. Um, for me, just personally, I think if I'm watching back Hell in a Cell matches, just I think Taker, Taker matches take a little bit priority. So that's why I had it at number nine. But. We'll take one guy from number nine. We'll take one guy from number 10, and that'll give us number eight. Batista versus The Undertaker, Survivor Series 2007. Now, this was a fantastic Hell in a Cell match. Two meaty men slapping meat. Um, but obviously, you had the animal Batista at the top of his game. You had The Undertaker. And to me, this is The Undertaker's absolute best run uh, was like from 2006 to 2009. Uh, just felt like he was very much at the top of his game, both physically and in terms of the character and what he was able to do. Uh, again, both in and out of the ring in terms of the psychological warfare of even just the entrances back. Like, that was peak Undertaker entrance era. Uh, and it also, it was always fun to have Teddy Long. Like, and tonight, player, you're going one-on-one -on -one with the Undertaker. Um, but yeah, Batista, also at that time, very much a rising star, and it felt like two opposing forces, a movable object, uh, meets irresistible force, and we felt that in this Hell in a Cell match. That's why I rank it just a little bit higher. Um, Batista would pull this one out, and again, I think this was very much between Triple H, uh, the feud with Triple H, and the feud that Batista had with The Undertaker. I think these were the two feuds that really cemented his status as an all-timer in WWE. So I, I think it deserves a little bit of credit also for what it did for the career of one Dave Batista. Armageddon, 2000, number seven, the six-man hell in a cell. Here you had Rikishi, the rock. I did it for the rock. I did it for the people. Uh, you had Rikishi, The Rock, Stone Cold, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The, uh, you had Kurt Angle, you had Triple H, and you had The Undertaker. Uh, so obviously, the six-man Hell in a Cell. I remember this from when I was a kid. This one brings me back. This is some nostalgia factor, max level 10, because I remember when this match was announced and it was uh, Mick Foley, who at that time was uh, the commissioner uh, of raw. And he was the one that essentially put this match together. And I think it was, was it Eric Bischoff was GM at the time was losing his mind. Cause he's like, no, you're putting all my top superstars in a match where they're all going to die. Uh, or it was some along those lines. But I just remember Mick Foley being the commissioner, putting this match together. And, this this also one of the best promos that we've ever gotten in WWE was The Rock uh, doing the promo of making fun of all the contestants uh, in the Six Man Hell in a Cell where he did impersonations of every one of them. That is fucking gold. Uh, the match itself was a little bit of a clusterfuck, but we ultimately, uh, you know, we got the really awesome spot. Um, where Taker threw Rikishi off the top uh, of the cell into the back of Austin's pickup truck. Um, 
Yeah, there, it was a little bit hard to follow, to be honest. There's a bit of a clusterfuck, but ultimately in the end, and I took, I can tell you, I took considerable grievance with this when I was a kid. Kurt Angle winning this match, and I'm pretty sure from what I remember, he pinned The Rock to do it. Ooh, that fucking burned me up when I was a kid. Oh my God, did I have fucking heat with Kurt Angle, which is hilarious because Kurt would then go on later to become one of my all-time favorite wrestlers to this day. If you ask me who's your all-time favorite wrestler, it's Kurt Angle. But I think part of that is because I hated him so much when I was 10 years old and was kind of seeing a little bit of the changing of the guard of, you know, I was still very much enamored with The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin, but it was definitely starting to feel like maybe those guys were a little bit on the way out, and Kurt Angle was definitely kind of the new guy coming in and the whole Olympic milk-drinking three-eyes shtick I fucking hated, which was great because he was a heel at the time, so that's what it was supposed to be. Uh, and I think, again, as I got older and developed a level of appreciation for heel work, uh, for comedy work, for in-ring technical skills, um, and just what a professional wrestler is supposed to be overall, like Kurt Angle, I mean, arguably one of the best that's ever done it. Um, so, again, very funny how much I hated him winning this match. And that's like a, a, a feeling and a core memory that sticks with me of like... He's someone that I genuinely fucking hated uh, from a kayfabe perspective. Because, again, I was only like 10 years old. Didn't fully understand, like, the workings of the business. All I know is this guy is going over The Rock and Stone Cold. What the fuck is this? And even Undertaker in this match. Like, so, again, this one uh, maybe a little higher on my list because of my personal feelings and entanglements with it. But... Hey, I also just really enjoy uh, a cluster fuck matches. I think that's uh, something that's in my wheelhouse also. Number five, the Usos versus the New Day at two, uh, Hell in a Cell 2017. This is one of my personal favorites uh, that I go back and watch every now and again. I think the creativity of this tag team match uh, inside of the Hell in a Cell, and especially I rem- what I remember was the way that they pinned the Usos in the corners with the kendo sticks, using the cell in an extremely creative manner uh, to almost like create these like little blockades where they were just beating them up in the corner. Uh, the way that the New Day uh, had control of the match initially, and then it switches uh, to the Usos, and it's just a crazy back and forth. One of the greatest tag team rivalries that's ever existed. One of the best tag team matches that's ever existed. I'm pretty sure. Um, I mean, there's been other like tag team matches in a Hell in a Cell. Like, uh, I'm remembering, like, uh, I just watched it back to uh, Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon with the Big Show versus DX in kind of a handicap tag match. That was kind of a clusterfuck. But like a true, just a true tag team championship match inside of Hell in a Cell. I think this is the only one that I can think of. And I'm pretty sure the only one that's occurred. But man, again, just when you talk about the Usos and the New Day, you're talking about literally one of the greatest tag team rivalries that's ever uh, been in WWE all time. Like it was that good that I would put it up against any other tag team rivalry. I mean... The only thing I could, I think you could say overrides it is like the kayfabe of the 80s and before of like when tag team wrestling was like real to people. You know, you shout out to Jim Cornette in the days of the Midnight Express and the, and uh, that kind of tag team wrestling. And like, yeah, it peaked, I guess, in the 90s when we had the Hardys, the Dudleys and Edge and Christian doing crazy ladder matches. But it like, in just a true... Again, tag team rivalry the way that I remember it when people ask me, hey, what's the greatest tag team rivalry in WWE history? My immediate thought, honestly, nowadays is the New Day versus the Usos. And I think that's a huge credit to them and what they were able to accomplish because, again, I'm 30, I'm dating myself here. I'm 35 years old. I know I might look a little bit younger, uh, but no, I'm I'm 35, about to be anyways. I'm born 1990. So, like, for me to think of, again, the New Day versus the Usos as the greatest tag team rivalry of all time, even above 
Hardy's, Dudley's, ENC, which I think in my mind is almost second. But the fact that there was three of them almost dilutes it maybe. Um, yeah, no, I think, again, one of the greatest tag team rivalries and matches, the fact that it was Hell in a Cell, the fact that it was a blow-off, the fact that it was for the championships, the fact that it was so fucking good and creative and just amazing overall, like, could have been even higher on the list. The only reason it isn't is I think everything that comes after will make sense uh, in terms of either legacy um, or just overall meaning and, uh, like, what it would mean to me as a fan. So we'll go into... Uh, oh, did I just fuck? Yeah, I said number five. That was number six. I seems like every time I do these top ten lists, I get lost somewhere. That's smoking too much reefer. All right, number five. Uh, Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins. Hell in a Cell 2022. This is the only recent entry on the list. Recent meaning within the last five years obviously the new day versus the usos 2017 just outside of the purview um but cody rose versus seth rollins to me the one of the best helena saw matches that we've seen uh in again in the last five years if you want to say in the last 10 years i think there's other matches that would take precedence including honestly new day versus usos but in the last five years and obviously because of the chesticle situation, uh, the the torn peck, the fact that Cody showed up for this match with his chest fucking purple as Barney the Dinosaur. This motherfucker's chest looked more purple than The Undertaker's entrance. This motherfucker, like, honestly, the fact that he was medically cleared to even wrestle this match does make me question the safety, health, and practice standards of WWE. But, I mean, I guess it wasn't his head. Just the, the idea of even moving from a vertical position to a horizontal position and back uh, with that kind of injury to me is fucking insane. Like, again, just think about lay you have that torn fucking peck look at it you can still see it in the graphic down there in the corner imagine having that lay on your and you're laying on your couch just get up seriously stand up and tell me how much fucking pain you're in so the fact that cody wrestled this match i think will always go down as one of the gutsiest toughest craziest stupidest performances i've ever seen in a wwe ring my only gripe with this match quite frankly is that cody won I really thought that was the only that was the only thing I took umbrage with was that Cody won this match. That genuinely to me is one of the stupidest booking decisions that didn't have the repercussions, fortunately, that maybe it could have. But the fact that, again, Seth had already lost multiple matches. Uh, Seth Rollins is a top level main event performer. Uh, one of the, I, I would argue also arguably one of the greatest of all time, but the fact that you had this situation where Cody came out and wrestled at all was already a win. The fact he didn't need to win the match against Seth Rollins. And the fact that he did, I thought actually, I thought it cheapened the rivalry a little bit because Look, if I can beat you with a fucking torn peck in Hell in a Cell, why, what am I bothering with you anymore? Um, so I just felt like you ended things kind of unceremoniously. It didn't do Seth any favors, I felt like. And really, it didn't do Cody any favors because yeah, he won the match and then he went away for eight months to recover like he was going to do anyways. Um, and, it, and then when he came back, really the only thing that he had to overcome when he came back was the idea of, oh, I got injured and that's it. Like I was, you know, I, I even won my last match injured. So it's like, felt like Seth Rollins definitely needed to win that match. I would have, there's no way in my, that I ever would have booked a match where I'd be like, look, Cody, I understand, but bro, you're already two and L against the guy. You got a torn pack. Like he needs to get this win. And then when you come back, if anything, when you come back, I think the best thing to do would be uh, have you try and uh, go after, 
like go after him because of the injury in that last loss and then take another L. And that point, now you're really questioning yourself because now you're back healthy. Now you lost again. Can you really do this? And then you have the the fifth. Now you've got an actual rubber match. It's 2-2. Two, two. You have Cody win that last match. And I mean, they didn't need any of that ultimately because, again, by the time he came back and he went to Royal Rumble and he won the Rumble and then he was on the path with the Roman Reigns, it was like this was all forgotten by then. And so this is why I say it's fortunate, I feel like, that this booking decision didn't actually impact anyone in this match. Seth was just fine. Cody was just fine. But if you're just asking me theatrically what I felt like was a better option, yeah, Cody definitely needed to lose this match. But, again, the the the, the entrance from Seth and then – revealing that he had the polka dot outfit uh in honor of dusty Rhodes, which i thought was just an especially heinous heel move and i loved it and then cody's entrance comes down he gets in and when he finally takes the jacket off and just the gasp that you hear from the crowd when they see that that chesticle like <gasps> oh my god so uh, and then the match itself i thought was extremely good even though again i shared my feelings about how it should have been booked in the end. Ultimately it didn't really matter. And the, you know, the Cody going over the way that he did, it was fine. The match itself was very technically good. I felt like uh, they could have used the cell a little bit more. I remember a lot more kendo stick action than, and stuff in the ring as opposed to like using the actual cell. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I still felt like this deserved a place on the list and pretty high up at that. All right, uh, now we get into, I think, the most infamous Hell in a Cell matches uh, just all in a row here, starting with Cactus Jack versus Triple H, number four, No Way Out, 2000. So it's funny because this one, very much, um, it's weird how much I feel like I don't remember this match, even though... I saw it live and I've seen it multiple times. Somehow this one just always feels like the lesser of the Mick Foley Hell in a Cell matches, even though this was a crazy fucking match. Like, and there are some people that will argue the complete opposite of what I just said, um, that they remember this one more than the other one, that they like this one more than the other one, that this is a more complete match than the other one. And when I say the other one, we'll be talking about it, Undertaker versus Mick Foley. Um, but to me, again, I I think Triple H2 at this point um, was kind of riding in between being a good guy and a bad guy. Because with Degeneration X, he had always kind of floated in between. And I know that at this time, too, he was very much wanting to ascend to being the top heel in the industry so that he could position himself in the same spot as The Rock and Stone Cold, but on the other side. Infamously, he had even the the thing that he said, I think it was Billy Gunn, um, where Billy Gunn had asked him, why would you split up DX? Why would you break off a good thing right now? And he said, because I, I want to be where Austin and The Rock are, but I'm going to be on the other side. I'm going to be the heel. Um, and so in terms of maximizing his heel potential and also unleashing his brutality, which credit to Mick Foley, uh, that has been a signature of his career. And especially, I think, even you could argue his WWE career as Mick Foley is bringing out the vicious nature of certain WWE superstars. So again, right away coming to mind, Edge, Randy Orton, and Triple H are kind of the three that I really think about of they were already on their way to being like tremendous heels. They were already pretty much locked in as top guys, but having those matches with Mick Foley allowed them to display a level of brutality and toughness to the crowd that I think really helps the crowd buy into them as, you know, not just kind of chicken shit baby, uh, sorry, just chicken shit heels, but like true threats to the guys that they want to see win. Um, 
And again, when you see the level of devastation that they're able to unleash on a McFoley when they're pushed to that level, it's like, okay, well, that can then translate into their brutality and to the rest of their careers. So I really love how Mick has always been able to bring that out of certain characters. And I think Triple H was one of the first truly in WWF, WWE at the time um, to, to have that happen for him. Because again, Triple H was already established as a top heel. But this match really, again, elevated the level of brutality that fans were cognizant that Triple H was like capable of. Um, you know, the the cerebral assassin, like all that's just words on paper until you actually see it in play of like, oh, he fucked him up this match. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, Cactus Jack versus Triple H. Uh, obviously, Triple H won this one. We that we talked about earlier. Uh, Mick Foley, the Buffalo Bills of Hell in a Cell matches, has actually never won a Hell in a Cell match, crazy enough. Um, but yeah, uh, this one goes down in infamy as one of the best and one of the craziest with one of the best, uh, like what was some of the craziest high spots. Uh, they did recreate a little bit of uh, the first um, crazy Hell in a Cell match, really. Um, but this one, it, like really, like it was the way that they did the spot. Um, through the top it was much safer it was much more planned uh, as opposed to the last time was very much like an accident which made it just a fucking car crash um so and we'll get into that a little bit but just again establishing i think uh cactus jack versus triple h you could even argue uh i could have put it number two i could have put it number one it really just depends how you feel uh but for me this is number four and that's because I think the next three on the list really um, just kind of makes sense. You know, to me, it's the beginning and end of an era. And so we'll go with the beginning of the era. Number three, The Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels in the first Hell in a Cell match. Um, this was confusing because it was promoted as bad blood, but it was at the I think the pay-per-view is actually called In Your House. Anyways, this was in 1997. Um, again, Shawn Michaels at the peak of his career, The Undertaker at the peak um, of his 90s dominance, because again, Taker's career spans so long that he has multiple peaks and valleys, I would argue. Um, so this was very much peak 90s Undertaker versus peak uh, 90s Shawn Michaels. And this was just a fucking really good match. Uh, Shawn Michaels uh, obviously doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of like the high spots. Uh, you know, he had the, he was dangling off the edge of the cage and he fell through a table at one point. Um, again, this was just a really, really solid, incredible match. And then the ending, I think, was very. There's bad cinematic and there's good cinematic. And I'm going to be doing the top 10 worst Hell in a Cell matches uh, um, also. Uh, so keep an eye out for that video. But just to kind of contrast and give an example, all right. One of the ones that's going to be on the other list is Seth Rollins versus uh, Dean Ambrose. They were having an incredible rivalry and feud. Uh, post shield breakup and their hell in a cell match coming off Seth Rollins using the stop to put Dean Ambrose who's fucking cinder blocks on Monday night Ross. I'm, that was like the coolest thing they had done in years, by the way, like I was fully invested in this feud all of a sudden. And then uh, we get to hell in a cell and they have, they're having this great match and it gets to the end and all of a sudden Bray Wyatt shows up and just, shits all over this match takes out dean ambrose uh allowing seth to win and then you know bray and dean have a feud and the whole rivalry with seth is basically forgotten and it's just like it ended up just being a big clusterfuck this was the complete opposite this was Kain! but it had been built up there had been like promos and references and like in innuendos 
uh, to this uh, character that was potentially coming uh, that had some kind of relation to the Undertaker. And so all of a sudden you're here, it's Hell in a Cell, you're invested, it's Undertaker, it's Shawn Reichels. And then all of a sudden this big red motherfucker just comes out, rips the door off, and just goes in, takes out the Undertaker, and Shawn Michaels is able to get the win off of that. And then that becomes the big feud as Undertaker versus Kane. And you can argue that feud maybe didn't go the way that they had imagined and planned. But that moment, I think, lives forever in time of Kane ripping the door off. And, and just, again, that's that's the way you do the, the, the interrupted ending, I think, in, in a way that benefits everybody in the match, um, including the person interrupting, uh, the person taking the L, and the person moving on from that feud to something else. So I think this was, this was beautifully done. And they've, I felt like they've tried to recreate it at other times and it just didn't work really. So this had to be number three for me. And at number two, it's the same two guys, but with Triple H in the middle, end of an era. The end of an era, Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania between Triple H and The Undertaker with Shawn Michaels, a special guest, referee. Um, again, this is very a personal thing. Like These lists uh, may as well be called my top 10 favorite Hell in a Cell matches. Uh, if you're asking me what is one of the Hell in a Cell matches that you re-watch the most, this would be the one. Um, because again, just the... The coalescence of the feud built over four years, not just between Triple H and The Undertaker, but going back to obviously the two matches of Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania, including Streak versus Career, leading into what would then be um, Undertaker versus Triple H. And even though Undertaker won that match, did not walk away from the ring. He, he did not walk out of WrestleMania, and that was like the first time that it ever happened to him, and he took that shit personally. And so that became the story and the feud for next year's WrestleMania of Triple H didn't want the match. Triple H was actively trying to say, I do not want uh, to have to end The Undertaker. Um, obviously, that was part of the build, uh, but it would lead to uh, the... Uh, uh, the Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania with Shawn Michaels uh, in, inserting himself very much in the feud and in the match as the special guest referee. And the match itself was killer. I mean, the, the back and forth, the near falls. Um, at one point, uh, you know, Shawn, Shawn had called it 50-50 down the middle pretty much the entire time until like towards the very end, uh, Taker... Um, uh, Taker was like threatening him or something um, and then kind of like turns around and turns back or something and eats a super kick like Sean finally gives in to the to, to the, the demons or whatever and he super kicks uh, the Undertaker right into a pedigree and he, and he oh the, the, the near fall on that one I tell you the audience is losing their fucking minds um, and then uh, ultimately uh Truly defined to the end again, Triple H, uh, but Taker would hit that final tombstone. Sean reluctantly doing the one, two, three, and then standing together at the top of the stage uh, uh, for WrestleMania. I think, again, end of an era of WrestleMania 28 will stand out in my mind forever as one of the greatest Hell in a Cell matches of all time. But nothing in my mind will ever top number one. The Undertaker versus Mick Foley at 1998's King of the Ring. Man, this match is, this match means something personal to me because you, I think we all have, as wrestling fans, have, have dealt with doubt from outsiders. That comes in different forms. Uh, that comes in, mainly two forms though wrestling is gay and wrestling is fake 
And whenever I heard those two things, whenever someone tried to say those two things to me, I usually had two two answers for them. Stone Cold Steve Austin, because if you say Stone Cold, they thought, oh, but not him. <laughs> Stone Cold was just unanimously loved by everybody, even non-wrestling fans. If you if they were like, oh, wrestling's gay, I'd be like, yeah, Stone Cold. They're like, oh, not him. I'm like, yeah, let's shut the fuck up. Uh, and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold says so. Uh, but no. Whenever that would really come up, and, or when it, people would say it's fake, they're like, all right, go watch Mankind versus Undertaker, Hell in a Cell, and you tell me how you fake that. You tell me how you fake getting fucking tossed like a drunk out of a club <laughs> by your fucking scruff of your neck and your pants off the top of a 16-foot cell through a fucking announce table. You tell me how to fake that. Oh, well, he knows how to land. Not from what I saw. Holy shit, he bounced right off that fucking table. That was the gnarliest thing I have ever seen in my entire life as a wrestling fan. Still to this day. Still to this day. Because, like, it's one thing to see that shit in backyard wrestling or in some off-brand foreign deathmatch company to see that shit in the WWE or at that time, the WWF, like the only other motherfucker crazy enough to do jumps like that was Shane McMahon. And even him, even Shane was not going head first. That's the craziest. I want you to think about that for a fucking second. Like even in the mind and aware, like the spatial awareness of I am doing this on purpose. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw myself off. There's a reason these motherfuckers always go with like an elbow drop or like a thing where they're going this way so they land kind of on their ass and on their back. I want you to think about how fucking cre- even the Swanton, if you think about it, even though you have to dive head first, you're flipping so that you're landing more flat, like theoretically on your back. I want you to think about the idea of just going. Phew. Face first with no flip and just being facing the, that direction of going down the entire time. And how fucking psychologically crazy you would have to be to just completely ignore your like fucking the synapses in your brain firing for survival instinct at that point. Like, what the fuck? What in the actual fuck? So. To me, the, the 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 toss, and that was the planned one. <laughs> That's the planned one. I've seen so many documentaries. I I have the video somewhere around here of uh, Mick Foley's greatest matches, and he does the commentary in between them, which I really love. Um, you know, he talks about actually how one of his best matches uh, ever was at mind games against Shawn Michaels in terms of just like an actual technical wrestling match. He felt like that was one of his better matches hearing this guy talk about, uh, the hell in a cell and the, again, the thoughts that he was having like, um, on the second fall. So the first fall, if, if anyone out there for some reason is not familiar and not a wrestling fan, doesn't know what I'm talking about. That match involves basically two giant falls. Uh, the match starts. Um, they come out. They both climb to the top of the cell. They fight a little bit on the top. And already you can see like the, the, the meshing is buckling under their weight. Uh, and then you get the toss off the top through the announce table. And J- Jim Ross, again, a credit to him in the announcement. He's like, he's fucking dead. Like, and they're wheeling this man out on a stretcher, and then he gets up off the stretcher and climbs up to the cell, top of the cell again. And you're like, there's no fucking way. And then Taker does the choke slam on the top of the cell. The the fence is supposed to hold. That was not planned. So it you could already see it buckling earlier. When he goes, he goes through and he he goes down, he hits the ring. At a really bad fucking angle. But at the same time, if you watch close, there's a chair that was on the top that actually follows and hits him in the fucking teeth. And that's what knocked his teeth out. And so, and then he had like a, a, a hole in his mouth. And so he was trying to stick his tongue 
in, in the hole, and that's what made it look like he was smiling. Uh, so, and they were like, he's smiling. Um, and then, like, at this point, this motherfucker, he was so just, con he was concussed beyond concussed. Like, this motherfucker was on Dream Street. That's why um, Tony Funk uh, has to get in the ring and take that choke slam from Undertaker just to buy him time. Um, and the fact that match continued still for way longer, honestly, like, an uncomfortable amount of time after. Like, it looked like Foley was just not even fully there. Like there's one point where uh, Taker tries to stand him up and he just kind of, you know, crumbles to his butt and it looks, it honestly, it's disconcerting. Like it's kind of scary to watch back sometimes. And, and then they still go through all the shit in the ring with the tax and, and fully taking the tax. And they finally, they do finish the match crazy enough. Taker ends up winning the match. And uh, even this, this match was so intense and so fucked up that when they wheeled this motherfucker in the back, even Vince McMahon, who, if you've watched the Netflix documentary at all, by the way, that's come out, now you're familiar like other wrestling fans knowing how fucking insane Vince McMahon is. Even Vince McMahon came over and was like, hey, that was that was too far, my guy. And please don't ever do anything like that again because that was just, that was absolutely ridiculous. I'm like... I'm, I can't I can't have you doing stuff like that. Vince McMahon said that to him. That's how fucking crazy it was. Ugh. But that'll wrap up our top 10 Hell in a Cell matches. Make sure that you catch uh, the top 10 worst Hell in a Cell matches. Uh, but until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. A positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled the rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm ballistic, vicious. Kept with the wristics, I read the terror potency. Epicetic gains, yo. And with the HMCs at extraordinary speed, some of the beers like some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws. Leave be shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with the clothesline from hell. Like Bradshaw, I'm toxic like septic shot. A dying breathe like cataracts.